everybody. Rap artist Takashi 69 today learned he will not be going home from jail, but will instead spend about a year in federal prison. The final punishment for the rapper, 24 months behind bars. The judge gave Takashi credit for 13 months he's already served. Then it's five years of supervised release. No criminal activity, no guns, no drugs. The judge also ordered 300 hours of community service, a $35,000 fine, and an $800 special assessment. The judge said that unlike most defendants, Takashi 69 can surely afford to pay those amounts. The sentencing capped the rapper's case involving crimes the judge summed up as involving selfish, reckless, destructive, sustained, and violent acts. Here's a look at Takashi's legal troubles. The rapper, whose music earned him nearly 9 million YouTube subscribers and close to a billion downloads just for one song, has a troubled legal history. I don't really want no friends, no. Takashi 69, whose real name is Daniel Hernandez, admitted to nine federal racketeering and weapons charges. He admitted to robbing people at gunpoint, admitted to drug trafficking, and said, I paid a person to shoot a rival gang member to scare him and to increase my own standing in the gang. Takeshi 69 did what many defendants do. Facing a maximum of 47 years in prison, he flipped, hoping his cooperation would help lighten his own sentence. So he testified for three days against two other alleged gang members, Anthony Ellison and El Jermiah Mack, and helped prosecutors score convictions. While testifying, Takashi 69 claimed fellow rappers Jim Jones and Cardi B were also gang members. Queens, Brooklyn. Cardi B admitted gang involvement in a 2018 GQ interview, but said Takashi 69's testimony was not true. But his rap sheet, dating back to 2015, includes a guilty plea for using a child in a sexual performance. His sentence back then was a thousand hours of community service. He also was arrested on charges he choked a 16-year-old boy. Still, Takashi 69 hoped for leniency. In a letter to his judge, he said, I am remorseful for what happened because I was blessed with the gift of an opportunity that most people dream of, but I squandered it by getting involved with the wrong people. He also said he feared gang retaliation. The judge said that while Takashi 69's decision to cooperate with federal authorities was impressive and brave, the serious nature of his crimes required at least some time in prison. The attorney for an innocent victim shot and injured by a stray bullet in a shooting connected to the rapper had this to say outside court after a statement from the injured victim was read inside the hearing. She went through a lot with the situation and today was her way of starting the healing process. And so at this point, that's all we want to focus on. We believe that his apology was sincere and we appreciate that he apologized for what happened. A man who identified himself as Takashi 69's biological father showed up to the hearing and tried to speak. The judge wouldn't let him because this man has virtually never been involved in the rapper's life. Outside court, however, that father said that because he himself was in prison for a while, that's why he wasn't involved. Here are some of his other comments to those of us who were there. I love him so much, said I miss you. How do you feel seeing him? Oh, beautiful, good feeling, a beautiful feeling. Yeah, I can't even prescribe it, you know, it's, it's crazy. Will you try to repair a relationship with him? Huh? Will you try to repair your relationship oh, with yes, him? Oh, yes, I do. If you can give him advice, what would it be? Uh, uh, try to start over again, new life, you know what I'm saying? And do, he got money, you know, he got millions. Why he has to do stuff that is not worth Illegal. it? You know what I'm saying? I will sit down with him and put him straight. You know what I'm saying? Huh? Yeah. The sentence fair? Yeah, yes, the it sentence, was. They give him 24 months. That's good. Which is not bad. He's fa he was facing 47 years. You know what I'm saying? But all the people he was around with, bloods and stuff like that, that's why he get in yam. That's why he's in yam. And then them, they are shy. Uh -huh. I don't understand that one. You know, he feel for it. Takashi 69 said in court that he recognized another man who he said was killed years ago as the father who actually raised him. Let's bring on our guest tonight right now. Byron Brown is an attorney in Phoenix. Gigi Gonzalez is an attorney in Miami. So Gigi, the judge said these crimes are serious enough for additional time, but the judge was very clear that Takashi got a great deal here. Others who pleaded guilty but who did not cooperate, he said, generally serve 8 to 20 years. So. Is this a good deal, a great deal, the best deal ever, or is it, as many of the fans are saying here, a bad deal? 
It's an excellent deal. You know, federal judges, they like to see three things. They like to see remorse, they like to see responsibility, and they like to see cooperation. And he, in this case, Takashi 6 9 did all of those things. He was incredibly remorseful. He took responsibility, offered significant cooperation to the government, uh, and, you know, apologized and made clear that he is remorseful. You know, he's 23 years old, he's very young, and I think that this is an excellent way of the judge making an example of a young person and hope of detouring other young people from following in his footsteps. Byron, same question here. The judge said he hoped Takashi 69 would be remembered for doing the right thing by cooperating while others are doing hard time in federal prison. So how do you characterize this deal? Yeah, I think it's a great deal for Takashi. I mean, he's already served 13 months, so uh, he has only 11 months left. And if you're the judge and if you're prosecutors, one of the things is you want, hopefully, other people in the same situation to maybe turn. They were able to get two solid uh, people off the street that were criminals because of this and even other stuff. So uh, I think it's a great deal for Takashi and the system as a whole. Gigi, the judge said he had no concerns about Takashi 69 joining a gang in the future since... Every gang everywhere knows he's a snitch, flipped, becomes government witness, and therefore no one would ever take him into a gang in the future. Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, it's a great assessment. Um, gangs don't normally affiliate themselves with people who cooperate with the government. So it would probably be a really bad mood move for any gang to recruit Takashi 69 given his status as a snitch. Byron, uh, last question here. Takashi gave a remorseful statement at times, tearing up, saying he hoped people would remember him as something better than an arrogant, disrespectful person. And he blamed the news for portraying him that way. Apparently, he thinks his own lyrics don't carry that message. The judge focused mostly, though, on the law, the conduct, and the cooperation, not so much the remorse, although the judge did acknowledge it. To me, that seems common in sentencing hearings like this. And I know we talked about the remorse a, a little bit ago, but, but is that your experience? Uh, well, with Takashi, I mean, I don't think that there's very much remorse. I think he's happy that he got away with what he got away with. And uh, at the same time, he's probably unhappy. He still has to serve time in jail. But I don't really believe that these kind of career criminals, which I believe he is, really have remorse. I mean... I guess the future is going to tell us, but I'm highly skeptical. You know, Gigi, we uh, we we saw this speech out of him uh, in court today, and uh, the big question on a lot of fans' minds is, what are the future lyrics going to look like from here on out? And I guess we can debate that subject for many months to come because it will be a while before he's before a recording microphone again. An Arizona jury has been deliberating for a third day in the case of a man accused of shooting a live PD state trooper in the face. James Casey survived that attack, which by process of elimination, Casey believes was perpetrated by defendant Ramon Bueno. Bueno was in the backseat of a car. Trooper Casey pulled over for having tinted windows. Three others were inside that car. Casey testified that the occupants were behaving oddly, so he asked them for ID. One gave a fake name and in the process of trying to figure out who that man was. Casey said someone opened fire on him while he was trying to write down the troublesome occupant's social security number. So, after about five hours of deliberations, the jury appeared unable to reach a unanimous decision. When the jury was brought in this morning, the judge read the impasse instruction, sometimes called a dynamite charge. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but only after you consider the evidence impartially with your fellow jurors. During your deliberations, you should not hesitate to re-examine your own views and change your opinion if you become convinced that it is wrong. However, you should not change your belief concerning the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinions of your fellow jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. I do not wish nor intend to force a verdict. We are merely trying to be responsive to your apparent need for help. If it is possible that you could reach a verdict as a result of this procedure, you should consider doing it. Please take a few minutes and discuss this instruction among yourselves. Then advise me in writing of whether we can attempt to assist you in the manner indicated above or whether you do not believe that our assistance 
and additional deliberation would assist you in reaching a verdict. The jury's been at it for 11 hours in that case and is asking some questions that the, the, the attorneys rather are fighting about right now as to an answer. And still ahead tonight here on the debrief, a Florida judge abruptly shuts down a triple murder trial there. Authorities say three people were shot when the, at the scene and then the scene was set on fire. We're going to explain the sudden delay even after opening statements were said and done. We're back in that case in just a moment. A Florida judge has shut down a trial against the defendant accused of shooting and killing three people and then setting the scene on fire. Xavier Whitehead still faces eight counts over the November 2018 incident. Victims Derek Archie, Haley Stone and Xavier Green all died. Co-defendant Ricky Wilkerson Jr. was slated to testify against Whitehead under a plea deal. Wilkerson pleaded guilty to being an accessory after the fact to murder and armed robbery. robbery rather. Just as the case was set to begin, the defense questioned Whitehead's competency. After the judge decided that Whitehead was competent yesterday, opening statements began. And then, today, after another evaluation, the judge shut down the case. Whitehead had been involved in a scuffle in jail, and the defense said he had been injured. Here was the result of today's competency hearing, where a psychologist described the defendant's demeanor in his jail cell and gave her ultimate opinion about his competency by phone. He said, everyone is trying to kill me. He said everyone was calling me a killer, and he mentioned that every time he looks around, he feels like everyone is talking about him. Anytime the door closes and he sees someone talking, 
he, he hears little murmurs and whispers, and he believes that, that those individuals are then speaking about him. And he had included me in that group, hadn't he? Yes, in fact, that was uh, when he sort of really broke down and uh, almost became uh, like a child in terms of his crying and his emotional presentation. At one point, he started crying heavily, saying, everyone talks about me, even Jamie, um, referencing, uh, you know, his attorney, you, and uh, saying that you had spoken badly about him and that he couldn't trust you and that he was really distraught about not being able to trust you anymore because you had basically betrayed him. And so what's your recommendation then? Um, should the court, the court find him not competent to proceed? Your Honor, I think that he should be, go to the state hospital. I think that in a different setting, he would benefit from monitoring and treatment, and I would hope that he would receive a thorough uh, medication evaluation as well. The trial is now canceled, even though the jury heard opening statements late yesterday. Prosecutors began by telling the story of the first responders who arrived at a mobile home fire. Those gentlemen eventually made entry into that house and they realized the obstruction behind that front door was the deceased body of Derek Archie. As they made their way further into the home, they could observe that Mr. Archie had a wound to his head. They also noticed that he was badly burned. They continued in through this home and came across a second bedroom. Again, this door was also somewhat obstructed from being open fully. As they had a chance to observe the contents of that room, they noticed that everything was strewn about. Drawers of the cabinet were pulled out, the mattress was flipped up. And obstructing the door to that room was the deceased body of Xavier Green. And in the corner of that room was the deceased body of Haley Stone, of the three deceased that were found inside the home. And you'll notice that in addition to the burns caused by the house fire, they are riddled with gunshot wounds. Detectives obtained surveillance video that they claim shows the defendant going up to the home carrying a gas can and then running away from that home as the flames spread. Prosecutors told the jury about the so-called getaway driver, Ricky Wilkerson, who allegedly places the defendant at the crime scene. But I anticipate that Mr. Wilkerson's testimony will be that he drove that vehicle that brought the defendant to that home that day. And yes, he is in custody because he has pled guilty to his portion of this crime. And he will identify that Xavier Whitehead was the person he picked up in that vehicle. He will identify that Xavier Whitehead is the person who walks into the house initially and walks back out to the side of the car, now wearing this black hoodie. That Xavier Whitehead, the defendant in this case, is the person who then reapproaches the front of that home and enters again. And while he's inside that home, Ricky Wilkerson will tell you he hears what he thinks are maybe nail gun noises. And what you'll piece together is that those are not nail gun noises. Those are the gunshots as Xavier Whitehead shoots Haley Stone and Derek Archie and Xavier Green over and over in the head until they are dead inside that home. The defense began by acknowledging that the three deaths add up to a heinous crime, but the defense says Xavier Whitehead is not guilty in part because it's impossible to identify who was wearing the black hoodie in that surveillance video from the scene. If we have a video and we're looking at a video and there's the fire, then you can see what it is. It's obvious. But what is not obvious and what is not going to be obvious to you is who goes into the house in the morning and who goes into the house in the afternoon. That requires any number of witnesses from the state. We know that they were shot. We know that they were shot in the head. We know that. We know that their deaths were caused at the hands of somebody else. It's obvious. We know that the house is on fire. So we admit all these things. And why does it get complicated? It gets complicated because at some point it doesn't become obvious. What is not obvious? What's not obvious is who did this. The defense says the cooperating defendant, Ricky Wilkerson, is lying so that he can get the deal of the century. Mr. Wilkerson is going to admit to you that he was an accomplice. 
He's going to admit to you that he was there for purposes of criminal activity of some kind. Because Mr. Wilkerson, you're going to hear this as well, was the first one indicted in this case for first degree murder. Mr. Rick, Ricky Wilkerson, driving that white Nissan Altima, was the very first person in this case indicted for three counts of first degree murder. He's going to plead guilty to that kind of conduct, but under no circumstances would he ever swear to tell the truth and then lie in order to avoid life in prison. He's got to sit up on the witness stand, swear to tell the truth, hoping that he avoids life in prison. Because the deal for Mr. Wilkerson, you're going to hear it, is five years followed by 12 years probation, or 11 years probation. Remember now, these opening statements were basically all in vain. Here is the judge telling the jury to more or less go home. Based on the representations of the state, then, um, <clears throat> And joining the concerns of the defendant, I um, will grant the motion for, right, I'll find him incompetent to proceed at this point in time. Having found the defendant to be sent to the Florida State Hospital. I would ask that Your Honor find that it is a manifest necessity that this trial be declared. It is, and the defense has already asked for it too. It is a manifest necessity that the trial can't proceed based upon that finding, and the defense has requested in this trial as well. So that motion is granted as well. Attorneys Gigi Gonzalez and Byron Brown are here once again. So Gigi, is this the correct call to make to basically just shut this down and turn those opening statements into, I guess, a practice session? It's definitely the safe bet. We've got a defendant here who is acting despondent, who's paranoid, who is expressing symptoms of not being able to understand the proceedings here. And the defendant has a constitutional right to understand every step of the proceedings and to, you know, gauge what's going on and to be able to aid in his defense. So the judge here ruled on the side of caution, declared a mistrial, and hopefully in these next three months, we'll figure out whether this despondency, whether this depression is symptomatic of um, a more uh, impressive diagnosis or just the fact that he is facing life without parole on the deaths of these three people. Byron Brown, the judge didn't very, didn't seem very happy trying to shut this proceeding down there. Maybe I'm reading too much into the body language. What do you think? Yeah, I think she's highly skeptical. I think when we heard earlier the testimony from Dr. Disney, who's the doctor who evaluated him, a lot of his symptoms were ones that would relate to anybody who's facing triple murder charges. Um, we heard the judge already rule before the trial started he was competent to stand trial. Then the issue was raised again, and then they brought in Dr. Disney to do the evaluation. So I think the judge uh, is highly skeptical that Mr. Whitehead is actually not competent to stand trial. But like Gigi said, she erred on the side of caution. So Gigi, what happens next now? Are we just basically hitting the pause button almost indefinitely, waiting to see if competency is regained at some point and we can continue on? Kind of. Well, from what I understand, uh, the new trial will take place May 2020. Uh, between now and then, the defendant is going to be undergoing psychiatric treatment. He's going to be getting diagnosed. He will be put on medications to ensure that he is competent to stand trial come May. I mean, the law presumes that competency can sort of come and go here, Byron. Uh, I'm remembering that from uh, at least Will's trust in estates. Is that similar in the criminal context? Yeah, it is. Well, but I just don't think that it's it's gone with Mr. Whitehead. I think Mr. Whitehead is trying to game the system. He's, I guess, technically won as of now. But I think what we're going to find into the new year is that he is capable to stand trial. The doctor who uh, testified that the judge is relying upon didn't perform a full battery of tests. So I think when we see that, we'll see that the judge's skepticism was uh, on the nose and he can stand trial. Yeah, Gigi, this has uh, been a proceeding that's been shut down a couple of times at this point because of similar issues. That's my understanding. And keep in mind, we sort of jump into these trials the minute before they start. We don't know every single thing that happened that led up with this. But if it has been a repeated uh, issue in this case, it's got to be frustrating. Very frustrating. You know, putting on these types of trials, it's hard work. And the defense and the state alike both put in months and years of effort into this very moment. So to have it be delayed by 
these types of issues, it's incredibly frustrating, yes. However, it's important to make sure that the defendant is actually competent and that we rule out every possibility that he isn't. And certainly I expect that we have families of three victims in this case anxious to actually watch a trial go down. I know that trials are about rights of the accused, that's what the Constitution says, but we are also entering the legal era in America of victims' rights being codified in statutes around the country. Thanks a lot to both of our panelists. That's all the time we have here on The Debrief. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 5 o'clock right here on Law & Crime.